why do they lost it, this capacity for self regeneration? Yeah, it seems. I I mean, we put forth a theoretical kind of explanation of this in terms of competition between germline stem cells and non-germline stem cells. And if you look at an organism like Planaria, it's full of stem cells. <laughs> Every part you cut, you have stem cells that can reproduce the whole. Right. Whole yeah. We have specific tissue-specific stem cells, but we don't have totipotent stem cells just running around in the body. Those are, are have been segregated into the germline. Yes. So Whereas, the embryo, the same stem cells are going to transform into sexual uh, cells. Some are going to go regular stem cells going through the body, and some are going to be segregated as gametes, basically. Yeah. So it's the same lineage. Some go become sexual cells, and some become st st stem cells. And that lineage is established early in embryogenesis. In some systems, a poster child for the opposite of absolutely no regeneration at all is, is C. elegans, the little roundworm that has been very well characterized. And there the, the germline is segregated in the first division. You know immediately in the first division which cell is going to produce the germline. It's pretty early in human too. Sometime in the evolution of complex multicellulars, you get this sort of competitive interaction between different populations of stem cells. But we know that for a fact. We do the experiment and we know that some of those cells are going to try to destroy or kill the other cells. We know that as a fact or it's a hypothesis? This is hypothesis. We know that immune system cells have that job in the body. But not so. Not immune. I mean, we, we, you call that an autoimmune disease now. It'll be an autoimmune destruction. Right. What's difficult to understand is um, we have to talk about the receptors because to receive information, you have to um, uh, transduct it, you have to understand it, you have to process it. For example, well, when we talk right now, it's just a little vibration in the air. It's very subtle, and that gets transformed through our inner ear and going from air to pushing you know, the bones in the inner ear and then going into water and then, then getting a neuron electric. So if we didn't have these receptors, we would not understand this little fluctuation of the air. Right. And, and I want, uh, maybe, maybe the wind is talking to us, we don't have the receptor. Maybe the photons are talking to us, we don't have the receptors. Maybe you know it just happened that we have the receptor for this very specific information, this is the vibration of the air. So, and the cells, you know, have oscillation, have heat as chemical changes, as pressure, have, you know, all kind of, uh, you know, uh, biophonons, you know, sounds. And I mean, how many receptors they have to be able to assess its, uh, its, its, its environment? But we have to first identify the different receptors and the different information a cell can receive. I assume first through its uh, its cell membrane or the, through the skin for a limb. I don't know if we know all the different types. For example, some human, um, they are tetrachromatic. They can see mm. you know, UV. They say up to 1% of the population can see UV because they have a new type of cone so that other people don't have. And when we see white, they see pinkish and blue, like, you know, all kind of colors we don't see. So if we have different recept information, go through receptors. And so if we identify the receptor, we have a better idea. But in, maybe we have a million of different types of receptor, or maybe hundreds. And it's uh, just a photon, just a light is amazing. And the sound and the oscillation and the, would be an amazing work. It, it's like, it seems so complex. Yeah, I think it is incredibly complex. The, the system uh, says, okay, well, maybe I'll try detecting this. But if that's not a useful thing to detect in that environment, then the system's just wasting energy detecting it, which is detrimental to its ability to do other things. So the, you can think of the system and the environment kind of negotiating about how the system should allocate its resources to being able to detect things. And to, to be able to do information processing with what it can detect. So we, for example, are uh, pretty good at 
combining language and vision in in action. And we have this incredibly acute visual system, not as acute as some animals, but pretty good. And we're very good at combining it with sound. Most of us are not so great at combining it with something like smell. It's amazing also is like, I remember they said that in human, every receptor receive and emit. They found that we can emit a little bit of light from our eyes, a little bit of sound from our ear. So talking about connecting with the environment, now you really have a two-way uh, avenue for communication. We're, as organisms, receiving all of these molecular signals, but we're also generating all sorts of molecular signals that uh, we probably can detect subliminally, uh, typically not consciously, but other organisms are very, very sensitive to. So we're in constant kind of olfactory exchange with our environments. And that's giving us information. And I think a lot of that is information that we ignore, particularly in this kind of modern technological urban kind of environment. Uh, but for our ancestors, it was probably very important. And certainly if you look at something like a dog that lives much more in that olfactory world, they're clearly talking to each other through olfactory signals. Everything we do is is giving our environment information about us. So the, the conversation we're having right now is an example. Writing a paper is an example. Yeah, we probably shed molecule right now in, in our environment and you shed molecule and if we're together, we'll share it. And so the pathways for bacteria, they are, is a more molecular chemical? I mean, they're, they don't have neurons. So sometimes we have calcium waves a wave that can unify and pretty fast enough will just alert the whole organism, something like this, of depolarization, a wave of calcium, a wave of... Yeah. I mean, in, in, in humans, for example, many of these signal transduction pathways that are very simple in bacteria are now very elaborated with many, many steps. Calcium is a very important bottleneck molecule, in a sense, that, that is a messenger for many different pathways. So on top of this biochemical signaling, there's bioelectric signaling, where the cells are talking to each other electrically, either through molecular interme intermediaries at something like a synapse, or directly by sharing charged molecules across junctions in the cytoplasm, in the membrane, so that many cells are effectively sharing a bioelectric state. And so you can have a hyperpolarization or depolarization of the cytoplasm. Right, right, right. Again, going back to planaria, a sequence of experiments that Mike's lab has done over the course of several years, which I've been involved in peripherally in terms of model building, has been to show that by changing the electrical environment of a regenerating fragment, they can switch between normal head-tail planaria and planaria that have two heads. On one head on each side. Yes. After they make this bioelectric change, nothing to do with changing the genome or anything like that. So they make this bioelectric change, these two-headed planaria breed true. So they regenerate as two-headed forever, as far as we can tell. If you cut but the they can be the planaria, you will have a planaria with two head. Yeah. And no gene it, changes. Nothing. What were the instructions to make a planaria with two head? If it's not in the gene later on... It's, it's being stored in, in effectively the electric field of the planarium. It is stored in the electricity, in the electric, the bioelectric field or of the cytoplasm of the animal. It's amazing. Yeah. So the animal didn't readjust to its environment, kept the electric change. Right. And, and you can actually switch it back to one headed again by making a bioelectric change. It remembers that change too. That's amazing. If the environment doesn't have an electric change, you can assume after a certain number of duplication, they will come back to normal. Or not? Uh, it, the change actually appears to be permanent. Wow. I, mean, I, I don't know how long they've maintained these lines, but I think they've maintained them over a long time. In medicine, we know we, uh, we can help regenerate with electricity. But in my hospital, during my MD training, I never saw too many uh, use of electricity in the hospital. Once in a while, it's very rare. So this, yeah. until we talk about neurons and really all different electric circuits of the heart, 
or we don't use so much bioelectricity, the field, I mean, electromagnetism. I mean, we don't talk about so much in medicine today. And it's so important. If you can make a permanent change to, in an organism like this, it's, it's amazing. And also talking about the fact we have electric devices in front of us all the time. No, I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge area to be explored. So bacteria work with chemical information, electric information, I guess, mechanical transduction, pressure and heat, radiation. They respond to radiation. Certainly things like light sensitivity, one finds in the microbial world. These creatures like E. coli are able to swim in a, in a rudimentary way by rotating their flagella together. And avoid they, obstacles, right? They will avoid obstacles. Bacteria can really only, they can, they can swim or they can kind of tumble. <laughs> Okay. They're they're not so good at, at at navigation. Just that ability requires uh dealing with viscosity changes in the environment. But you get something like like paramecia, a much a much smarter organism. Paramecia uh, the one with the little hair all the all the right. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's a complicated eukaryotic cell. It's not a, a, a bacterium. They're very good at finding obstacles and moving around them and this sort of thing. Without eyes. So without eyes, right? Yeah. Do we know how they avoid obstacles and go back up and go around? I don't. I, I assume a lot of it's cytoskeletal, that they're sensing things with their cilia. How do you quantify the information if you have uh, electrical information or chemical information? Well, for example, if you're thinking in terms of ionic exchange, so the, f- the fundamental way of communicating electrical information in cells. You know, I'm giving you one sodium atom or two sodium atoms or three. <laughs> They're, they have to cross some barrier, a gap junction or something like that in the membrane to get from me to you. It's a quantized process at the level of individual ions. And if we zoom up and, and coarse grain all of this, it looks like a continuous flux. If you're looking at a molecule that this ion just barely fits through, a channel molecule, for example, then it's it's very much a matter of one at a time is passing through here. Yes, I remember H2O can pass one by one through some aquaporin and so, but so you look calcium, potassium, sodium, all right. So you look at, you know, with the quantity that can be changed through a bacteria or through a muscle, or you can put that in a formula. What are the differences in the environment that the cell is capable of detecting? So can it tell the difference with some receptor between this concentration and that concentration? And what are you trying to achieve to get a model and they expect something. The longer term goal is to be able to interface directly with what the experimentalists are doing in terms of trying to understand cell-cell communication, where they are in the, in the land of specific molecules and specific electrical signals and so on. Try to understand the language of the cells. Right, exactly. And then interact maybe, maybe with them. Right. Yeah, we would like to be able to to talk to cells in their language, basically. Actually, what we do with our hands is we try to engage a communication with the tissue and with the cells using pressure and stretch, but also heat. We we'll also have our own, you know, electromagnetic frequency in our hands. And right. yeah. so it is trying to talk to the body and engage a change. Somebody had an accident 30 years ago, big uh, adhesion, scar tissue, fibrotic tissue. We want to release that and talk to the cells in order to create a different type of change. This person doesn't need to be protected anymore. There's no more a car rolling over them. We need to affect change. And sometimes the, the uh, tissue has uh, no sense of uh, update and we need to update the tissue to, to today. And you know, one of the definitions of trauma is the present is the past. So those cells are still in the past, mm. interacting to a trauma, and we try to release them and engage, you know, and communicate with them with our hands. And it's something that you do a little bit uh, slightly differently. And some studies show that we could perceive with our human sense uh, at the level of angstrom, not even nanometer, not micron, we're talking angstrom with our hands. So um, there used to be no micron, nanometer, but now one angstrom 
is something we may be able to perceive with our human hands, which is amazing. Just like, you know, they decide that we could, our retina will react to one photon, which are very, very small quantities for, for humans. Yeah, souls are fortunately much, much larger than that. I think one of the most astonishing things I've seen is the electrical manipulation of morphology and planaria. Yes. And that really suggests that there is a lot going on in this signaling modality that we don't know about, and that there's uh, an enormous amount to learn about what's happening in terms of electrical communication in non-neuronal cells. And of course, there's tremendous amounts to be learned about what's happening in electrical communication in neurons. Sure. It's a wide open field. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. For yes, your- thank you. Creative very mind. interesting conversation. Yes, very interesting conversation. We follow up. I always post things on my website. Perfect. We're going to keep it. Everything's there. Thank you so much.